to start recording this. So our topic is pressure drop. So pressure drop generally only occurs um, when we're dealing with either pack bed or plug flow. Yeah, question? Uh, I don't because I'm about to move over there. It should still be recording though, it's an okay mic, so it should still be getting all this. Um, pressure drop is only going to occur on PFRs or PBRs. So remember, PFR was what we used for a plug flow reactor. A plug flow reactor is like the simplest reactor you could think of, which is a tube. Um, it's easier to make than any batch reactor because it is a tube. Um, a pack bed reactor is very similar to a plug flow reactor. Uh, it's typically exponentially more difficult to make, but not in terms of actually constructing the thing. The thing is a tube with pebbles inside. Um, the exponentially more difficult part is which pebbles do I put in there? Um, that's a very difficult question to answer. Either way, either one of those have um, a phenomenon called pressure drop associated with them. If you've already taken 101A, you're somewhat familiar with pressure drop in pipes. If you have not taken 101A, you will become familiar with pressure drop in pipes. Um, we're going to look at it in essentially the same manner that we do in 101A. We have to make one modification that actually makes life worse for us than it does in 101A when we deal with a packed bed reactor. Um, because we don't approach anything quite that level of complexity in 101A. Um, and yet there's really only one good way to handle it, uh, which is the way that we handle it. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between these two. Um, we will get to... Exactly. Yes, that. We will get to more notes in a moment. But I have some examples of what these things look like so that we can try to get some physical understanding of why these terms are important. Um, and I'm going to eventually need some volunteers. First, the difference between the two in terms of what an actual reactor might look like. This is a plug flow reactor that you might be familiar with. You've probably never seen one unless you're potentially doing something illegal because this is a catalytic converter. Um, and so if you've seen one of these and you don't know why you saw it, you were probably ripping it off of somebody else's car so you could go sell it. Um, that's usually where these things show up. At any rate, um, the tubes that are on here are actually square. So I'm going to send this around so you can take a look at it. Please don't drop it. It's made out of ceramic. Um, so it's very hard, but it's very brittle. If you drop it, it will shatter everywhere. What you can't see, you can hold this up against the light and kind of see through it, or see through this side. Actually, I'm not sure how much is still clear. Um, you cannot see what is called the catalyst that's inside here. So deposited along the surface in here are tiny little catalyst particles. Um, you can't see them, even if you crack it on the floor, don't do that as an excuse to see the catalyst. Uh, it's too small for you to see, um, so they're usually quite the tiny. But this is an example of a plug flow reactor. There's really nothing inside those squares that you can um, impact if you're a gas, it's just traveling through the square tubes. We can modify all of our uh, equations to handle squares just fine. In fact, the geometry never actually shows up in these equations, only the volume shows up. Um, and so this would be, I don't know, a couple hundred squares in parallel uh, for a plug flow reactor. The reason by the way it's called a plug flow is because when the gas comes in, it never does anything except move from inlet to outlet. Uh, in a real system that's not plug flow, a little bit of that flow will turn around and go backwards from turbulence, but we assume that that's not um, relevant to something like this. I don't have an explicit pack bed reactor, but a pack bed reactor is a large tube that is then filled up with something uh, called a catalyst, which I guess I can't, well, I'm going to pass it around anyway. Uh, this is Dr. O's sample of a bunch of random catalysts. Again, it's made of uh, glass on the outside, so please don't drop it, it will shatter. Uh, all kinds of different catalysts in here. They're designed for different purposes. I don't know what all of these catalysts are, but there's quite a few shapes in there. The most common ones are cylinders and spheres. Uh, and we can do pretty well in terms of pressure drop for cylinders or spheres. If you look up towards the top, you'll see some weird kind of macaroni-shaped ones. Um, we don't have a great expression for pressure drop for those. You just have to pack them up, throw them in a bed, and measure the pressure drop. Um, we don't have a great way to predict those. The idea of the macaroni-shaped ones compared to the other ones is to get a really high surface area with very low pressure drop. Anytime you lose pressure, you're essentially losing money. Um, you had to pay a something, probably electricity or gas or something like that, in order to get a pump to supply that pressure. When the pressure gets lost by traveling over these catalysts, you're essentially losing money. 
Um, and so we try to minimize pressure drops. So very small pressure drops are good, large pressure drops are typically bad. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're uh, avoided in all instances, depending on what kind of catalyst you have, you may need a very large pressure drop. Uh, so I would pack these around as well. I don't know how old the duct tape is on the bottom of that, so don't jiggle it around or anything. Um, I don't know if those are safe either, so don't let them come out of that container because I don't know what they are. So the, the phenomenon of, of pressure drop occurs in either one of those, but in one case it's big and in one case it's not. Um, maybe not big, but at least significant enough that we have to worry about it. Uh, so I have two reactors up here. One is a pack bed reactor, one is a plug flow reactor. Uh, the pack bed reactor is a tube, as you will not be surprised. Ooh, I can use the document camera for this. So the kinds of things that go into packed bed reactors, as you'll see when that catalyst eventually makes it around, um, are essentially little spheres or little cylinders. Uh, and so I'll pull the plug off of my packed bed reactor here and show you what's going to pack. We packed this one with polystyrene B. Polystyrene is not a catalyst, but I'm not trying to convert anything. I'm just trying to show you what the catalysts look like. So I'll leave them in my hand. Does anybody have a banana? Do you have a banana? Could I have it? <laughs> you can throw it. Okay. Don't hit her in the head. <laughs> <laughs> so that's about how big they are. Banana for scale. <laughs> so they're typically quite small. An average size for a um, catalyst particle, where's my catalyst particles? Wherever those catalyst particles are, you'll see a couple of larger ones in there that are on the order of maybe like 5 millimeters to maybe 10 millimeters. The weird shaped ones up at the top, the macaroni kind, those can be very, very large, uh, but they're usually structured in such a way that the pressure drop ends up being rather small. The vast majority of them, though, are like 5 millimeters. <coughs> um, if you get down too small, if you think about sand, sand is on the order of like half a millimeter, something like that. Imagine trying to, well, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so about a couple millimeters in size for most diameters, um, but the larger ones can be a little bit more oddly shaped. So what I'm doing here is I've got a packed up reactor. This is 200 proof ethanol. Um, it has been denatured, so it's going take it. Does anybody know what denatured means? Yeah, they add poison to it. That's what denatured means. So. Um, and so what I need is an example. I need somebody that wants to volunteer to blow through this tube. Come on. I need another volunteer <laughs> to hold their hand at the other end of the tube. We're going to do this twice for two different tubes. Anybody else? Come on. <laughs> so I have one that's 15 inches of alcohol. Obviously, don't lose the game. So all you're going to do is try to blow through that tube. Can you stretch out a little bit so that this is going straight? And all you need to do is hold this, and then put your hand right here, and tell me, oh, no, not like that. You'll never do it. Just hold your hand about an inch away, just like that. Now see if you can get your breath to go through there and hit her in the hand. Good? OK. So this is a plug flow reactor. It's not hard to force gas through a plug flow reactor. It's just a tube. You can make these things probably to the end of the room back there, and we'll still be able to blow them up through there. Let's compare that then, you can throw that on the floor, um, to a packed bed reactor. So this is actually an even bigger tube, so it should be even easier to get through. Um, and yet it's been filled with these little catalyst particles. Uh, so I'm going to rinse off the end here. Now, in addition to not pulling in, don't hit this backwards or go to not pull the Okay? Same thing. Yep, just hold your hand right on there. See what you can do. No, I don't do it. Okay. 
Maybe. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> not very much, right? So the tube is even bigger. These things are not particularly packed in there very tightly, right? It's not like we've closed it off with wet sand or mud or something like that. And yet, we can't get any air to go through there. The air will eventually go through there. If you were to push hard enough, it would go through there. But it takes an awful lot of work. Where was the air going? He was obviously pushing air in. What happened to it? It's blowing back. Some of it could be coming back out if he didn't know it. Where else could it go? If it wasn't coming out this end and it wasn't coming out that end, but it was going in, it must have been accumulating in here, right? It must have been pressurizing somewhere along the way. That can happen. You can get an awful lot of pressure along this tube until you get all the way over to this particular side. So thank you very much for your uh, effort there for both of you. Round of applause for our volunteers. <laughs> So you can absolutely do it through here, but it takes a lot of work to do it. And I don't mean work as in like a lot of design. It actually takes a lot of work in the thermodynamic sense from your pump to put a big enough pressure on this side over here to actually get the stuff to come out on this side. When the system's running at steady state, there is no accumulation inside. So when you first start the thing up, there might be a little accumulation, but that's nothing that we're gonna worry about in this particular class. Uh, we're gonna assume that the thing is up and running uh, but the key point is the pressure drops in packed bed reactors like this are usually quite significant. It's very hard to ignore the pressure drops if you have a packed bed reactor. Yeah. If you have those macaroni shaped catalysts that are going around, sometimes you can neglect the pressure drop or something like that. Even then, uh, there's kind of a lot of pressure drop that you might have to worry about. Why is that important? The reason that that's important is we had that lowercase v that we had introduced on Friday, the one that represents the volumetric flow rate. That is a function of pressure. Um, and as we had mentioned, that's not something that we can get rid of for a gas system. Uh, it's there and it's there all the time because the gas can expand or contract either way along the axis of the reactor, um, even though it's contained by the wall. So in the radial direction, it can't do anything. But along the axis, it can and it will. Um, and so we have to always keep that in mind. It becomes a much bigger problem when you're dealing with a packed bed. Um, precisely for that reason, the gas has to flow over all those particles. You don't need the skin, do you? Oh, okay. But it should be fine. They hit the floor. It should be fine. I will happily buy you another banana if that one is not to standards anymore. So how do we uh, deal with pressure drop? There's two different ways that we can deal with pressure drop. One way is to just get lucky and somebody tells you it's not necessary for that problem. Um, that'll be the case on a fair number of your um, homework problems where we'll just assume that pressure drop is called negligible. Um, and so you won't have to deal with it. On all the other ones where that is important, where's my pen? <laughs> um, today's lecture will show you how to deal with that pressure drop. Regardless of which project you choose, which should be posted, I have to post your homeworks first today, um, but your projects will be posted either later today or tomorrow. Um, regardless of which project you choose, you will have to deal with uh, pressure drop in both of them. Um, so let's see. I guess we'll just skip right to the flow chart and kind of deal with it after that. So you have a, a quick question to ask yourself at the beginning of any problem. Is the, does the word isobaric show up anywhere? If the word isobaric shows up, you're in pretty good shape. Um, there's no need to worry about any of this business with um, pressure drop. You'll give uh, pressure at the inlet to your reactor and it'll be the same as the pressure at the outlet. So if your answer to is this isobaric uh, is a yes, you're pretty much good to go. There's, you don't need anything from this lecture um, if it is isobaric. If it is not, you have to kind of fall into a series of checks depending on the complexity of the problem. How difficult do you want to make it? If it doesn't explicitly say whether or not it's isobaric, the next question you can ask yourself, uh, by the way, this is more or less going to be a a vertical flow chart and the, the yeses will be on the right and then we'll just keep falling down this way if you're trying to figure out how much room to give yourself in notes. The next question to ask yourself is, is this thing a liquid? Right? Am I pumping a liquid through a 
plug flow reactor? Am I pumping a gas through a plug flow reactor? Um, et cetera, et cetera. If it is a liquid, um, you're in good shape. We are going to approximate this as isobaric. There can be significant pressure drops in liquid, but again, they're, they're mostly incompressible. So if you force a little tiny element of fluid in one side, it's going to immediately pop out the other side, or I should say force something else out of the other side, um, such that pressure drop is essentially not relevant. Um, the parameters that are of importance here, you can probably remember a term that looks like this. That showed up. Uh, in either the V term on the bottom for a batch reactor or the little V term on the bottom for a flow reactor. Uh, and so that ratio of pressures is about one. So the P0 is the inlet pressure, and the P up here uh, is pressure at any location V if you're in a plug flow reactor or any location W if you're in a packed bed reactor. What do I mean by it's a pressure at any particular location? What we're going to end up finding is that these things are functions of how far along the tube that you've got. So the pressure drop, for example, that I need to go through a tube that is this big, so what is that, about six feet or so? Uh, I can represent the pressure drop along that tube anywhere along the tube. So I can get a pressure drop to here, to here, to here, to here, to here, etc. Or I can just plot the pressure all the way along here, and you'll see it scales pretty smoothly from the inlet pressure here all the way down to the outlet pressure there. So we can, when I say P over P0, we know the inlet. The other P can mean a pressure anywhere inside the reactor. Um, including the outlet of the reactor. So we can plot that the same way that we plot, for example, temperature going, well, we haven't done that yet. Uh, plot flow rates down the reactor, plot conversion down the reactor, something like that. Um, we can do the same thing with, with pressure. But if you're a liquid, you don't have to worry about it. This ratio is essentially one, so the pressure is constant um, everywhere inside your system. If it is not a liquid, i.e. if it is a gas, we're not going to deal with pumping solids. Um, we can pump solids more in the form of like really viscous fluids like a polymer or something. You can actually convey a solid, but it's, we don't have a lot of reactions that take place in the solid phase. Um, the next question to ask if it is not a liquid, I'm going to have to go on to the next page, is what's the type of reactor that you're dealing with? If you are dealing with a plug flow reactor, so remember, a plug flow reactor is just a tube. Uh, there's, there's nothing else to it. It's just a tube. If you happen to be dealing with something like that, then for the most case, P over P0 will again be approximately 1. This will generally be the case um, Basically, if you don't have any other information, right? If I don't tell you anything about a pressure drop, if I don't tell you, you know, two geometries and I tell you to worry about pressure drop and it's a plug flow reactor, then we just make this assumption. Um, this will not be the case on the project. Uh, and we have other forms to deal with plug flow reactors in other cases. But if you're not given any other information, let's, let's word it that way. lacking any other indicators. This is not a terrible assumption. Generally, we assume that this is about one in comparison to a pack bed reactor. If you were to try to do exactly the same kind of reaction inside a pack bed reactor, this would look essentially isobaric. The pressure would be almost constant compared to the drop that you would see in a pack bed reactor. So this is not an uncommon assumption that you will see on like homeworks and exams um, where we'll say, oh, it's a plug flow reactor neglect pressure drop. Uh, the last kind of situation, let's see, uh, no, second to last, um, is a more general one, well, actually less general, which is specific to this class. Are you dealing with a uh, pressure drop on a homework or an exam? If you are, then we have uh, a still entirely accurate way to deal with it. I just remove a couple of the algebraic steps for you. 
Um, it's still perfectly accurate. <coughs> then you have to do um, one of two things. I can give you the form of the pressure drop in one of two ways. One way will be, uh, let's make it green, uh, will be to give you pressure is just some arbitrary function. So I could just say it's some function of P0, T, uh, maybe W for weight of catalyst, or volume if you've got a PV, PFR. All right, I'll just give you an expression and say the pressure follows this expression, use it. What does that mean? It means you take that particular form of the pressure, take this expression, everywhere you see a pressure like that, plug that function in there, do the math the same way that you would have anyway. If I give you a form like that, it's very common that you'll have to go over to MATLAB to use it um, because these things can get fairly nasty fairly quick. Um, the other form that we could give you, I could give you is I may not explicitly give you a form for pressure. I could give you an expression for pressure drop. So I could give you the change in pressure per mass of catalyst uh, could be some other function of the inlet pressure, the temperature in the reactor, the weight of the catalyst, or the volume. Um, and we'll see what that uh, common one looks like in a moment. We will use that. So generally, it, that means I will give you some form for it. Certainly, if you're in case two, that's a case for MATLAB, um, because now you have another set of differentials, um, which I will briefly sketch right here. If you are in that particular case, then your dy dt in MATLAB will generally look something like, uh, for example, dx dt if it is isothermal, uh, or sorry, non-isothermal, like if it's adiabatic or something. Not t's, why am I saying t's? v's or w's, whatever you want. w. What that means if you're in that last case is that your new one here gets tacked on. So you could have an additional differential dp dw uh, that you also have to solve for. It really doesn't change too much about the approach. Um, as you saw with a multi-reacting or a, a multi-reaction system for a batch reactor. Oh, I put my thing down. Um, you can have as many of these as you want all the way along here. ODE 4.5 will handle it just fine. It's a little more typing for you, but it doesn't change the approach to the problem at all. It just means you have an extra um, differential that's floating around. If you're in case one, that just means somewhere in your um, equation is going to be that expression P over P0, and you just dump the expression in there, um, and that's P. If you're in case two, you'll have to solve that um, differential explicitly. Uh, okay, last case, if you are not, oh, I forgot to label these. So this is a no, this is a yes, this is a no. If you're not on a homework or an exam, i.e. you're on a project, either for this particular class, um, or you're actually trying to you know, design a reactor and you would like to know how the thing um, is about to function, then we have essentially two different forms, one for a pack bed, one for a plug flow. Um, and you pick whichever one you have, either plug flow or pack bed, uh, and you use that one. So the only remaining one is either a project or, I don't know, what else would you call it? Not 113, right? You're trying to do something outside of 113, maybe as another project, maybe you're actually designing this reactor for a job somewhere, um, and you need to know what pressure drop works, how pressure drop works in something. Um, there's two particular forms that we're going to use, uh, and I guess we'll just do one of these. Uh, the first one is if you're dealing with a plug flow reactor. If you're dealing with a plug flow reactor and you need to know what the pressure drop looks like, both of these, by the way, are differential equations, um, the equation that you want, which you have actually, either you have derived in 101A or you will derive in 101A, um, it just has a, a somewhat different look here, um, is equation 4-36. in your book, 
Um, and if equation 4, 3, 6 looks like this, the change in pressure, this is a weird one, as a function of length. So not weight, not volume, but actually length down a tube, which in order to get from length to something like volume or weight, uh, you just need to know the geometry a little bit. So we'll talk about some of the geometric parameters you'll need here in a moment. And I will designate that L in a minute. Uh, is equal to a couple of different parameters. The first one is a G. That is not a 6. That is a G. Times the change in velocity with respect to length. Which again, those are two more parameters. Initially, the change in velocity with respect to length isn't a parameter that shows up anywhere else. But velocity is related to volumetric flow rate through a density. Length is related to either volume or weight by another density. So you can change these things back and forth to something more useful, um, which your book does right underneath 436. It shows you how to change this into something that um, looks like all of our other differentials. Um, it's just way easier to write it in this closed form. Um, and then minus a correction factor, uh, 2f g squared over rho d. So a couple of the terms that are on here, uh, which we will point out. The L here is length. Let's see, is it worth sketching a diagram? Not quite. Uh, the U here is velocity. G is an interesting one that we don't use a lot inside reaction kinetics. Um, this is a mass flux. Uh, so mass flux looks like um, kilogram per area per second. Why do we use, actually, you'll see mass flux pop up in both of these expressions. Why do we use mass flux? Because it doesn't change. It's constant. So even though the amount of moles can change as you go down a reactor, even if a reaction is occurring, even if the pressure and the temperature are changing, mass is always conserved. So we haven't destroyed any atoms. And so the amount of mass moving per unit time, per unit area down your reactor is always constant, no matter what the assumptions of your reactor are. The only, actually, yeah, that holds. Even if your uh, Reactor is changing geometry, right? If it goes from narrow to wide, this will scale in such a way that it's always constant. We do not have any variable area reactors, so it's not like you have to worry about that. Uh, the row here, we've got another row coming up. In, actually, we've got two more rows coming up in a minute. This is the density of the gas. That can often be a pretty strong function of temperature. Um, in fact, it can be its own function of pressure. So for example, if I needed to know what that was, you could dump the ideal gas equation in there and figure out an expression for rho as a function of temperature and pressure and any moles that change. Um, and so that can be a, a fairly complicated term. Anybody from 101A remember what the letter F is? Friction factor. Don't worry, if you haven't taken 101A, you do not need to know how to get a friction factor. Uh, it will be given to you. These are things that we can either calculate analytically if the flows are simple, um, or we can go out and measure them experimentally uh, if they're quite complicated. But we have generalized correlations that if you tell me what the geometry and the flow rate are, we can tell you what a friction factor is. A friction factor physically represents how much drag is induced by the wall. So the wall isn't moving. The particles are. When a moving particle hits a stationary wall, it slows the particle down a little bit. Presumably, you are not allowing your reactor to accelerate. Um, that would be a problem if your reactor is moving. Uh, and so the friction factor is talking about how much do those impacts slow the gas down. Um, we're not going to go into it in any more detail than that. It'll always be a number that you can either look up from a table um, or given to you as an expression. The end result of this expression, uh, after you do the variations that you'll get in your book, so your book will start here and show you how to make that a little bit easier uh, in terms of changing those differentials into things that we can measure in a reactor. The end result is somewhat um, simple. The end result is an explicit equation for pressure compared to the inlet pressure. 
uh, and it's 1 minus a parameter called alpha p times volume v, and all of that raised to the 1 half. Sorry, what is what? V? D. Oh, D. Thank you. I forgot to define that one. This one, good question. Oh, that should be yellow. This is the diameter of the tube. Uh, so, for example, the diameter that we're talking about, where's my big catalyst thing? The big ceramic piece? Where's that at? Got it over there? There's two different diameters that you have to look at for most patch or plug flow reactors because most of them are made up of lots of little tubes like this. Uh, and so there's two potential diameters that you can use here. One is the full outer diameter of something like um, whatever this happens to be, that diameter, so what is that, maybe 10 centimeters, something like that. That's not the diameter we're interested in. The diameter that we're interested in here is what's the diameter that the gas sees? And so if I've subdivided this area into a bunch of smaller tubes, I need to measure the um, diameter of those individual tubes. That's the one that goes inside here. Um, and so as a result, this mass flux also has to be mass flux through a single tube. Um, you will get amazingly high pressure drops if you take the total mass that's supposed to be going through this entire reactor and pretend that it's all funneled down into one tiny little um, diameter here. So just keep in mind that when we're talking about these, we're talking about single tubes. Um, if your reactor is made up of multiple tubes, then you have to scale G and D appropriately for a single tube. Uh, the pressure drop along the length, though, is the same no matter which tube I'm in. So I, I'm essentially calculating this for one tube and applying it to all of the tubes. But that's normal, right? The pressure drop between any one of these tubes uh, doesn't change. Same for all of the tubes. Good question. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, and in fact, I will comment that on here. So this is just for one, two. And similarly, your mass flux over here is just for one, two. One, two. And so as I said before, this is probably the form that you'll end up using. The alpha p uh, is a big grouping of all the other terms that are in here, things like um, densities, g's, f's, rho's, that sort of stuff. Uh, it's all given right underneath equation 436, um, so I'm not going to write the other alpha here. This is essentially the form that I would give you if you look a little higher up in your uh, flow diagram here. So case one, where I just give you an expression, p is some function of all those other things. What those functions will generally look like if I just give you those functions um, will be one of these folks down here on the bottom. Right? I will give you that and tell you alpha is like 0 0.001. Um, and you'll plug that in there and crank away as you do. So let's see, do we want to do an example of that now? Let me at least give you the pack bed. We'll do uh, an example of how to use that equation. Um, we should have enough time. If we don't have enough time, we'll also get to it on Thursday. Uh, so that's for the plug flow reactor. That is in green and yellow. I guess I'll do the next one in blue and gray. If it's not a plug flow reactor, then you are probably dealing with a packed bed reactor. Um, and I'm going to put that on the next page. The equation for the packed bed reactor um, has a special name that we'll get to in a minute. The number in your book is equation 422. This will only come up on a project. Um, we will not use this uh, on any kind of homeworks. If I ever need to give you an expression on a homework, it'll be a simplified one like that. But you will need to use it on the project. Um, if you're dealing with a packed bed reactor, the form that we have for this is dp dz. There's another expression um, that's a little bit different, right? What is z? I have no idea why they do this, um, but z is exactly the same as l. Like these two equations are like one page different in your book, and they choose two completely different variables to mean exactly the same thing. Just how far along your reactor did you go? Um, which again can be changed to anything like 
weight or volume of reactor uh, through something like a density that we'll see uh, as we go. All right, this has a couple of components to it. There is a negative sign sitting out front. That's what, actually, let me just move the negative sign up top in case it's not clear. So the first parameter is G over rho GC D sub P. Uh, G sub C, if you don't remember, has a unit of one. That's the gravitational conversion constant. In SI, it's exactly one. Yes? Could it be that in fact that um, since they, it, it takes too much work, they use gravity to do some of the work, so that's why they use G? Could be. Yeah. I would still use L for that, though. Mm -hmm. uh, you could still use L for that, because you're just talking about a general length down a reactor. But it would be curious to see where that trend got started. How come they use L for one and Z for another? But they mean exactly the same thing. Um, so GC will usually not show up. If you're in SI units, it's one. Um, if you're in uh, imperial units, it's 32 point something, something, something. I can't remember what it is. Uh, it's that factor that relates one newton is one kilogram per meter, square, or per, meter per second squared. Um, you can look them up. There's only two of them. It's kind of like R in that sense. They do not come up very often because we use SI units. The D sub P here is the particle diameter. So particle diameter is something that you have to either measure or you have to be provided. Um, easiest way to measure it, go buy a catalyst particle and put a ruler next to it and measure what the particle diameter is. That definition can change a little bit if you have a non-spherical particle. Often this would also be considered the diameter of, for example, a cylinder. Um, so they usually will use a, a squat cylinder, so the diameter is exactly equal to the length of a cylinder, and then we would plug it in there anyway. Those are the only two geometries we're gonna deal with. The other term that comes after this is one that we'll have to introduce in a moment. Uh, one minus phi over phi cubed, uh, we will Describe what phi means. Uh, we, it might have to wait till Thursday to describe what phi means. Um, the name of phi is called a void fraction. If you want to impress your friends and still be accurate and you want to tell them what you're working on, you are calculating the mass flux through the void fraction. Right? If you basically just want to say, like, please leave me alone, I have to work. There you go. Mass flux through a void fraction. One minus, 150 times one minus phi times mu uh, divided by that same particle diameter. A um, couple of terms here. This is the gas viscosity. Typically we assume these things to be air. Uh, the viscosity can change a lot with um, uh, temperature and pressure but for reasons that we will soon see, it is usually minimal. The term that comes next to this is 1.75 times your mass flux G. This term over here uh, is a pressure drop that's due to something called laminar flow. If you are in 101A or have been through 101A, you know what laminar flow is. If you don't know what laminar flow is, it means if I'm a particle of gas and I'm moving in a tube from here to the back of the room, I never move off of this relative location. So for example, if I am that particle of gas and I'm going this way and my height is initially here, I stay exactly on that streamline all the way through the end of the pipe. Um, so that's called laminar flow. Uh, this term over here, is due to what's called turbulent flow. So that's sort of the other option. If you're not laminar, then you're probably turbulent. Uh, and turbulent flow is just sort of the opposite, right? Instead of staying in one relative location all the way through the tube, now you're jumbling around, right? You're moving up and down. You're even moving forwards and backwards a little bit. Um, generally, things are much more chaotic. Where did this expression come from? Well, first of all, the name of this expression it is a popular expression. It's called the Ergen equation. Uh, 
Uh, and that is the equation that I had mentioned in your book. Um, they will again give you a variation, right? They will convert it for you from uh, dp, dz into like weight of catalyst, um, something like that, which is usually the much more common way to use it. Where did the Ergon equation come from? The Ergon equation came from, you actually get right up to the point of the Ergon equation in your fluids class, or you will if you haven't taken it yet. Um, it looks at basically turbulent flow inside a pipe. That's where you get to in 101A. And the very next topic on there that's sort of a, a left turn, it's only important if you're doing this, what happens if you dump a bunch of uh, catalyst particles in there? We don't know. Um, we don't have a way to calculate what happens inside there. We go out and we measure a bunch of stuff and fit it to this equation. However, we can fit that very, very well. Uh, and hopefully this will not crash the iPad because I put the picture in before I started. This is where that expression comes from. So all the little points that you see on there are people actually out, they just have a plain old tube like this. There's no reaction occurring. That pressure drop occurs in the absence of a reaction. And they go out and they measure a couple of those parameters. Um, these are lumped in a way that they all collapse onto one nice looking plot. Um, and then they fit an expression to it. And so that's where this 150 and that one point, what was it, 75, um, that's where those come from. Uh, somebody went out and they did a bunch of measurements. They fit that equation to it with two adjustable parameters. So they fiddle with those adjustable parameters until that line goes right through the data points. So we're talking decent accuracy. Uh, I can't zoom in on this for, actually, I'm not even going to write on it because that could crash the whole thing. Let's just point it out. There is nevertheless variation, right? Uh, even if you look out here, if you have a, a particular, this is sort of, um, denoting the combination of the size and characteristics of the particle with the flow rate, and this looks like pressure drop. Even for a fixed um, bed, something like this, there's still a fair amount of variation, right? It could be, for example, between two and three. So you could have like a 30% variation or more, um, even though over a span of many orders of magnitude, that thing works really well. Um, and so it's one of those engineering approximations that we have to make. Don't take it as set in stone, though. If you go out and try to measure that pressure drop, expect a decent variation from this on the order of like 10, 20% um, is pretty normal. If, however, you measure it over what they have done, which is almost one, two, three, almost four orders of magnitude, it works pretty darn well. Um, it's hard to get things to work over four orders of magnitude. So this is the data um, that's behind that particular expression. There is a little bit of... Uh, what gets considered drama in fluid dynamics. It's about as close to drama as we can get. This number right here, it's still under some back and forth, a little bit, a little bit of a corrosive dialogue around these two. Some people are under the impression that this is 1.6 and not 1. Point. I'm not kidding. People will publish papers trying to figure out whether that's 1.6 or 1.75. We will use 1.75. Um, I'm not going to get into their arguments. I'm sure they're passionate. Um, and we won't go any further than that. We won't mention it. Right, so Ergon equation is what you need for a packed bed. Uh, there is no name for this one. That, it doesn't have a name. It originally was derived from the Bernoulli equation, um, but this form of it doesn't have a particular name. You could probably call it the Bernoulli equation, but nobody would really know what you're talking about um, because that's not really a form of the Bernoulli equation that we see very often. Um, so it doesn't have a name. Uh, it's just equation 436. Um, but this one is the Ergon equation. We will do an example on Thursday. We don't have any more time um, of what this actually looks like when I go in and integrate things and how it affects things like conversion and stuff like that. Um, but that's enough for today. We will come in for the exam Wednesday. Um, good luck. I will see you then.